All right, today's message is called the highest blessing. We just heard from Jesus that if the world hates you, that we're supposed to remember, we're supposed to know that it hated him first. That in fact, if we belonged to the world, the world would not hate us. Right? But it's because he has chosen us out, because we don't belong here, that the world feels enmity and hatred toward us. So that's a strange scripture verse for me to then come up here and say that we're going to learn about the highest blessing that the Bible has to offer, because the blessing is probably not what you think, you know? After today, let no one accuse me of simply filling your minds with, like, happy, fluffy messages that tickle your ears, uh, because that is just not what I'm going to do today. I have an obligation to you as your pastor and as a minister of the Word of God to tell you what it is the Word says, even when it's not a comfortable topic, even when it may not be what we want to hear. God wrote it down for us, amen? amen? And so we need to know what it says. So today's topic, we're going to find it in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. We're going down the list of the nine S's of discipleship as we have. So far, we have talked about the scriptures, the state of the dead, the sanctuary, salvation, and of course, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Today in verse 9, the word of God tells us, I, John, your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. What does that word tribulation mean? Anyone with a more modern translation than the King James is going to see a different word there. Suffering. Suffering. That's exactly right. The sixth S of discipleship is suffering. Yes, you heard me right, suffering. And believe it or not, that is the single highest earthly blessing that the Bible promises you, is to suffer on behalf of Jesus Christ. And that requires some explaining, does it not? I can't just kind of dump that on you and expect you to accept it. We need to really see what the word has to offer. And so let's start with Jesus Christ. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 10 through 12, Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Wow, that's a tough command, isn't it? I mean, we have to rejoice, which is tough enough, but we have to be exceedingly glad. We have to, like, jump up out of our skin with gladness when people treat us in this way. Whew. I mean, the master of the universe says that this should bring us joy. Clearly, we need to know how. Well, let's notice something about this particular passage. It is the eighth and final passage uh, excuse me, eighth and final beatitude that Jesus gives us as he opens the Sermon on the Mount. And so open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Open your Bibles. We're going to read it all together, okay? We're going to see something very interesting here. The Beatitudes is a series of blessings that God promises to his children um, when they, by his grace, achieve the various things on the list. I want you to see that they are progressive in nature. They build upon one another. And so let's start in verse 3. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, that's easy enough, right? What we have to do is be poor in spirit to recognize that we need something we don't have, that we are deficient in some way. Well, if you are poor in spirit, you will mourn, verse 4. You will mourn for your lack of completeness. Why would you mourn if you have nothing to mourn about? Well, if you are mourning, you will be meek, verse 5. It's tough to be mournful when you're filled with pride. So the mourning comes first, then the meekness. If you are meek, you will hunger and thirst for righteousness, verse 6, because righteousness is the only way that the meek see justice. It's the only way they have any inheritance at all righteousness. When you seek after righteousness, you will be, by default, merciful, verse 7. 
you'll have pity and compassion for your fellow man. Selfishness destroys righteousness. Mercy exemplifies righteousness. When you are full of mercy, you will be pure in heart. Verse 8. God says in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus Christ himself repeats that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 7. When you have mercy, you have the heart of God. The very heart of God. It makes you pure in heart. And when you, are, when you have a pure heart, will you make war? Is that what people with a pure heart do? No, 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 of course not. You will be, rather, a peacemaker, verse 9. Then and only then, when you are a peacemaker, when you have a pure heart, when you're meek and humble in spirit, when you search for the righteousness of God and not your own self-righteousness, only then can you find a blessing in persecution. If you are not a peacemaker, your instinct is to rebel against persecution. It is to fight back. It's to make war. You will behave in a way that diminishes and destroys the blessing that God promises from persecution. And so that's, can you see why this is not only just a blessing, this is the highest blessing. It's not for baby Christians. It's not for those who are weak in the faith. It is a blessing for those who are sanctified in spirit. If you can receive the blessing of persecution, it is evidence that Christ lives in you. Because human beings cannot find blessing and persecution outside of Jesus Christ. If you have received and you truly appreciate your salvation, God will give you this blessing. I'm going to give you a Bible illustration, okay? I want you to see how maybe some of our forefathers in the church have dealt with this subject. And so turn in your Bibles, okay? Again, this is something that, it's a long passage. I want you to read it with me. It is Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 20, okay? The book of Acts is the fifth book of the New Testament. It's after the Gospels. I'll give you a second to get there. Say amen when, you're, when you've got it in front of you. Okay. The story here is that Paul, okay, all right. Um, Paul has gone to Philippi with Silas. So the two of them have gone to preach in the province of Philippi. While they're there, they run into some trouble. A demon, excuse me, a demon-filled uh, girl follows them around, gives them issues and trouble. And so finally having enough of this girl, they cast the demon out. And of course, that takes away her supernatural ability to do the things that her owners were charging for. She like told fortunes and stuff. And so now the demon is out of her and these people can no longer make money on her and they are mad at Paul and Silas as a result. And so they turn on Paul and Silas. And uh, verse 20, and they, these other men, brought them, Paul and Silas, to the magistrates and said, these men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Who wants to get beaten with rods today? Nobody does, right? I hope that you've never had that experience. But if, but if you have, you know that's not a pleasant one. You get beat with something hard, and repeatedly, and while you're naked. Because notice, they, they, were, they tore off their clothes. There's no padding in between the rod and their skin. Well, what happens? When they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. That word stripes, that means that they broke skin. These are, you know, they got beat with these rods. And if you were familiar with the Romans, they, they didn't, it's like as time went on, they got more and more cruel and severe. And so while the Bible doesn't tell us specifically 
uh, history and culture lends us to believe with a fair amount of accuracy that these rods probably were not just sticks. They probably had shards of metal on them. Okay? And so when the Bible says that they got beat, they got beat. Their skin was torn. And when they had laid a few stripes, is that what the Bible says? Many stripes. When they are broken and bloody, what? Do they go free? No, no, no. They get thrown into prison. Do they go to the hospital first? No, no. They go to prison. They have shackles on their, uh, on their feet. No antibiotics. No Tylenol. No morphine. They're put into a dark dungeon with no hope of escape, no hope of freedom, no first aid. And what do they do? At midnight, what does the Bible say that these men do? They're singing. And not only are they singing when they're beaten to a pulp and imprisoned in a foreign land, but they're not singing lamentations. They're not singing, why, God, have you allowed this to happen to me? Woe is me, boo-hoo. They're not singing that. They're singing hymns. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. If you would not be praising God in this situation, you are not ready for the highest blessing. What happens to Paul and Silas? Do you think God honored their faith? Do you think God came through with the blessing that he promised them? Was there a blessing indeed for them? Let's keep reading. Verse 26. At midnight, while they're singing, suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Let's take a step back and absorb that just for a minute. Oftentimes when the authorities would fail, when they would um, be sent to apprehend someone and not, or when they were put in charge of keeping someone in jail and failed and the prisoner escaped, the punishment of the prisoner was enacted onto the authority. And so this man knew that if under his watch these men had gone free, he was probably going to be thrown in prison himself or worse. So rather than face that, he pulls out his own sword ready to kill himself. This is it would have been a better fate in his mind than to go to the Roman authorities and say, oops, I don't know what happened. They're gone. Now, if Paul and Silas had fled, right, what does it say? Everyone's chains were loosed. All the doors were opened. What would you do? You would run, right? Do Christians break the law? And so they stayed right where they were. And as a result, they saved this man's life. Paul knew what this man was doing, and he says, do yourself no harm, we haven't gone anywhere. Remember, they still have not been treated for their wounds. They did not get up and run to a hospital. They did not get up and run back to Peter for miraculous healing. They did not do this. They stayed, even though they were free, to minister to this man. Let's keep reading in verse 29. Then he called for a light, this is the jailer, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Hallelujah. So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Wow! I mean, wow! This man and his family will have eternal life in heaven because of this persecution. Did Paul and Silas need salvation? They already had it. To them, it didn't matter. They were the least important people in that jail. It was much more important to minister to this man. And look what the Lord did. 
they got their first aid, they got their freedom, they got food, and they got not only this man, but his entire family to believe in the Lord, to be baptized, and to be saved. Is that a blessing? That's a blessing for everyone involved. And now, who knows? We don't know anything about this jailer after this point. Jailer may have had to go into work the next day and say, oops, I don't know where they went, and face all that same stuff he was scared about in the first place, but did it matter anymore? Now, he's back to the same place that all of the early Christians were, saying, it doesn't matter what you do to me. God has promised me eternal life. Do to me what you will. I'm going to heaven. See, Paul and Silas knew that it was a blessing to suffer for Christ. They were not afraid of persecution. They knew that Christ would show up in their lives and give them the strength to endure whatever happened. It didn't even matter what happened. Christ would get them through it. The disciples were made bold because of this. This idea that it just didn't matter what was coming. They were willing to take risks that they would not have otherwise been willing to take if they were so scared for their own personal well-being. Oh, I can't go talk to that person. I don't know what's going to happen. I can't go to this unfriendly city. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to stay right here in my little comfort zone, surround myself by people who think exactly the same thing as me because nothing bad will happen to me if I do that. That's not what these early men did. And because they had this boldness, because they took these risks, the entire world changed. In one generation, the entire world that they knew, from India to Spain, was changed in one generation. These men used every single opportunity that they could to witness for Jesus Christ, regardless of the cost, even if it cost them their lives. It was worth it to them to get just one more soul to heaven. And so, because they thought that, because they would have that attitude of, what's the worst that could happen? I'll be rejected. I'll be imprisoned. I'll be beaten or killed. So what? Because that, that was their attitude. Look, Acts chapter 5, verse 40 and 42, 40 through 42, says, When they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name, and daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. The Jews had just said, hey, don't do this anymore. Just so you know how serious you are that we don't want you to do this anymore, I'm going to beat you up a little bit first. Now go. I don't want you preaching in that name anymore, or I'm going to see you again, and it'll be worse. And they left and immediately went back to preaching and teaching. They felt so blessed that they were able to receive this highest blessing that the Bible has to offer that they, they, it's like they just didn't care. They went, it says, in every single house and daily in the temple. They went to the church, and for everyone who didn't come to church, they went to your home to make sure that you got to know Jesus Christ. They didn't even take time to heal. They didn't go home and say, what was me for, for you know, a week? They didn't put you know, antibiotics or, or some like soothing lotion on. They didn't sit there in bed and say, maybe tomorrow I'll go preach. They got up immediately. Well, why is this relevant? How does this actually affect us in 2010? Well, soon, brothers and sisters, we're going to be heading into the world. I don't know exactly when, it depends on a lot of factors, but soon, you and I will be going into the world to preach. Therefore, I hope that you're really learning things from the sermons and the doctrines classes that I'm giving you. I hope it's not going in one ear and out the other, because I'm trying to equip you for meeting these people who don't believe what it is that you're saying. I'm trying to give you the tools that you need to live a Christian life, to be a good example, and to meet their objections. Otherwise, what's the point? Your job when we're out there is going to be to take risks, to be bold for Jesus Christ, to talk to strangers about the Lord. The whole idea of evangelism is to confront the devil where he lives, right? It's to not just accept, to passively accept when like a, a lost soul comes to you and say, oh, hey, by the way, let's talk about Jesus. No, 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 it's supposed to like 
go into the very gates of hell and say i know the lord jesus christ evangelism is about actively increasing the kingdom of heaven and most of the time it actively increases the membership of the church although that's a secondary goal not a primary the primary is heaven while we're out there doing this will everyone be nice to you will it always be easy do you think maybe someone might call you names I think someone might insult you someone might intimidate you So do you have the same zeal for the Lord as Paul did, or Silas did, or as Peter did? Are you willing to say, it doesn't matter if it makes me uncomfortable, I'm going to do it anyway? Is it that important to you? Are you ready for the highest blessing? Are you willing to suffer through 10 rejections before you find one receptive person? How about 20? How about 30? What about at the very end of time? Jesus promises that that won't be easy. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 21. He says, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Can you think of some pretty horrible times of distress from history? How about September the 11th? If you're not quite sure how horrible that was, I'd be happy to tell you someday. How about the Holocaust? How about the Dark Age persecutions? Jesus promises the very end of time will be worse than all those things. It will be the worst thing the world has ever seen until that time, and it will be the worst thing the world will ever see forever through eternity. And you and I, whether you like it or not, have been called to live at the very end of time. So Mark, verse 13, excuse me, Mark chapter 13, starting in verse 9, 9 through 11. To learn a little bit more about this, Jesus says, Watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. That means to witness to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a tremendous promise? Do we have to sit there and plan it all out and write it on a piece of paper? Do we have to spend the entire night before worrying and freaking out? Jesus says specifically, do not worry about it. Don't even premeditate it. Even if it's in your head, even if you have the time to do it, don't do it. Because if you do it yourself, you will reject the blessing of the Holy Spirit doing it for you. And not only that, but again, they're going to take you into the synagogues, right? Because there will be apostate churches at the end of time, right? The church and the state will come together again. So the church will be a courtroom as well as the secular courtroom. We're going to be taken everywhere that there is to be taken. Why? To witness. That's what Jesus said. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them, to witness to them, to open the Bible and say, you're wrong because God said so. Let me tell you what God has done in my life. Mark 13, verses 19 and 20. Jesus says, For in those days there will be tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. So that's a repeat. But he goes on to say, And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake whom he chose, he shortened those days. Very, a couple interesting things about this. First of all, um, if you don't quite understand this highest blessing and where it fits into the great controversy, then you miss the point that Jesus comes not because it's arbitrary, not because he's mad at us. He comes to rescue us. In the absence of Jesus coming back, humanity will self-extinct. No flesh would be saved. It will get so bad on the earth, we might, I don't even, I don't know how it's going to be. Pestilence, disease, earthquake, it could be nuclear bombs. I don't know. But it will be so bad that humanity will self-extinct if Jesus doesn't come back to get us. Also, notice the verb tense. Unless the Lord had shortened those days. 
from our perspective, it's still a future tense, right? Does God live outside of time? In God's perspective, it's already done. Unless he had shortened, or down there, uh, except for the elect's sake, he shortened in the past tense those days. It's already done. God has already come to the rescue. He's just waiting for us to catch up to that. Luke 21, I'll find a little piece of this. You will be betrayed. This is verse 16 through 19. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head shall be lost by your patience possess your souls. Um, A more modern translation will say something like, because of your patience you will inherit your souls, or something like that. So, will there be anyone who is safe? If you don't love Jesus, is there anyone who's safe? Your very family, your friends, your brothers, your sisters. If they don't love Jesus like you do, they're not your friend at the very end of time. You can't trust them, they will betray you. Jesus promised. Therefore, is it important to reach the people you love for Jesus now? Because if it gets to this point in time, it's too late. You don't want to be betrayed by your loved ones. You want them to be on God's side with you. So evangelism is important. And because of our endurance, right, not a hair of your head shall be lost. Does that mean that we're going to be fine? No one's going to touch us. We're going to live in perfect harmony while the world is falling apart. Maybe God does have promises to that effect, but maybe not because Jesus is promising that it's not a hair of your eternal head. You will not be lost forever. By your patience, you will possess your souls. He has your eternal soul waiting for you. If you endure to the end, you get to claim it. So why is it important? Why is it important to spread the gospel? Despite the persecution, right up until the very end. We have to go to the Old Testament book of Daniel for three of the most powerful verses, I think, in the whole Bible. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Talking about the end of time. At that time, Michael shall stand up. Who's Michael? Yeah, Jesus fighting with the devil. And he's coming for the biggest battle that the universe has ever seen at the end of time. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. That's now the third time we've heard this. Let no one tell you that Christ made this up, because I'm reading it to you from the Old Testament book of Daniel. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. We're looking forward to being part of that group with everlasting life, amen? Although we will study that other group with shame and everlasting contempt in a future Bible doctrines class. It's a little more complex than you can understand simply from this verse alone, and so we will study it. So the time of trouble comes before the resurrection, but, and here's why I brought us here. This is so beautiful. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Isn't that beautiful? Do you want to shine like the stars forever and ever? I do too. Who gets to do that? From the Bible, from Daniel 12, verse 3. Who gets to shine like the stars forever and ever? Those who do what? It's right there in front of you guys. Turn many to righteousness. That's the evangelists. Those who get up and preach boldly. Rescue others from the pit of hell. Those who are not scared to enter the dark world and shine a light for Jesus Christ. So, I'm going to close with a tip for you, okay? How then can we find strength amid suffering and persecution, whether it is emotional suffering or, heaven forbid, physical suffering? Where does that strength come from? How can we be bold enough to go and do what we need to do despite this threat? 
Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus says, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. If this comes your way, you look to Jesus. You recognize that he already suffered every single little bit of the suffering that we must endure. He knows how to endure it because he already did. If you connect yourself to Jesus, if you look to him for wisdom and strength, then whatever is going to get you through it, he will provide. He endured it already. I want a friend like that. You know, I want a friend who can say, it's okay. I've already done it and overcome. Stick with me and we'll overcome together. So are you a Christian today? Do you want to take Christ's name as your own? Do you want to be the Christian of the world? If so, then let's be willing to follow where he leads. Even if it's hard to do that, we have to be willing to go where he goes. We have to deny ourselves, take up our crosses daily, and follow him. Let's remember that he will never put us in a situation that we can't handle. That's a promise from 1 Corinthians 10.13. You're allowed to take him up on that promise. God, I'm failing. You said that you would get me through this or give me a way to escape. I'm claiming that promise. Help. You watch. He'll come to your rescue every time. Let's look to the risen Christ for strength and endurance because we don't have these things unto ourselves outside of Jesus Christ. And as the days of the earth draw to a close, brothers and sisters, let's be ready to receive the highest blessing that heaven has to offer us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this is a hard message. It's not a message that we like to think about. In our world, we, we create police forces, courts of law, governments, United Nations. Uh, we try to make every single possible thing that we can think of to avoid the mistakes and the persecutions of the past. We like to think that is a chapter of human's history that's behind us, and yet you promise that the worst of it is yet to come. So today, let us deny ourselves. Let us and help us realize that that means that we have to face this, whether we want to or not. That if we ignore it, it's coming anyway. And rather than ignore it, we have to be ready for it, prepare for it, connect to you because of it. So when the test comes, we're well prepared. So that no matter what hardship we have to endure, when it's over, when we look you face to face, in your eye, we can hear those words we all want to hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Help us today to remember that that's our goal. Help us to connect to you today and tomorrow and every single day. And fill us up with your love so that even in our darkest hour we may know why we are doing this. And we may keep our eyes on the prize ahead. In the name of Jesus, I pray these things. Amen. Father, as we part ways today, as we leave this place of worship, help us to remember that to you, suffering on account of your name is worship. That it's not always about feeling happy, jumping up with joy, but sometimes, Lord, you call us to the worst the world has to offer so that when we get to heaven, we can truly appreciate what you've done for us and the difference between that world and this. Help us to realize that if we are too attached here, if we are too in love with the things the earth has to offer, that you are the universe's best divorce attorney and you are very willing and very able to send us the things in our lives that will divorce us from the earth. Help us to be ready for that. Help us to love you 
and not our things. Help us to love our eternal life and not our earthly life. And help us to be ready for the trials that come, no matter what they are. Lord, I pray on behalf of myself and my family, both my actual family and my extended church family, I pray your mercy upon us, that we might be ready for a persecution that we never have to face, that you deliver us from evil, that you deliver us from temptation, that you send us out of harm's way when this comes upon the earth. But if that is not your will, my God, then fill us with your strength, your spirit, and your grace so that we can endure what comes and we can boldly glorify your name no matter what the circumstances. Help us all to remember the great finish line in front of us so that we can all go to heaven together and live in a world where whatever we have to face down here will seem like a distant, dim nightmare. Thank you, God, for doing what you've done for us. Thank you for already suffering our hardships, and thank you for being with us as we go forward and face what is yet to come. In the name of Jesus, 